I hope you can hear me as well. Thank you very much, Jael, for the nice introduction. I would also like to thank you for inviting me to this uh, conference. When I was asked uh, quite some time ago, I thought, well, this is going to be a small gathering in Oslo with some Norwegians and so on. And, well, it turns out to be, I believe, the biggest gathering in, in family history activities in Norway ever. And not only that, it's definitely the most international one with 28 different nations present. So, um, well, it's somewhat different what I envisaged originally, but uh, I really enjoy being here. I, since uh, I'm also going to appears to be the only Norwegian speaker both today and tomorrow, I would like to take the opportunity to thank my heritage for bringing this conference to Norway. I mean, it's, uh, it's something very special and uh, at least I appreciate it very much and looking at the audience, I think we all do. It's something new. I hope it's so successful that it will be repeated, maybe in other countries, but uh, you are very welcome to come back to Norway again as well. So I hope, hope these things will continue because it's something new and uh, we need new initiatives. Um, when I was listening to the introduction from Jael, I start realizing I'm becoming an old man. I've been involved in this for a long, long time, although I've worked in the oil and gas industry for 30 years and retired for six years ago. And uh, when I retired, well, since then I've been full time on family history. At least my wife tells me so every day. <laughs> um, the, my presentation, since I'm a Norwegian, and in general doing most uh, Norwegian uh, family history work, it will, of course, be a focus on, on uh, the way we're doing genealogy in Norway. I also mentioned that uh, I'm not representing any company or organization or society. I'm just here on, on my own. So if, if you disagree with me, that's fine. But uh, it's only myself. Um, if you look at, this is working, yeah. I'll give an introduction and also tell a little bit about sort of activities, projects I'm doing. And I have also pulled together some sort of rules or guidelines because I, from time to time I need to remind myself, well, what is good practice in these things? because it's so easy to get excited and got carried away. And I have quite a few uh, examples from uh, SuperSearch, which is, uh, to me is an excellent tool. And towards the end, I will also talk a little bit about there are ways to get help, because when we're doing family history studies, we always need input and help from others, because we cannot know everything. And a different... A, a, Different eyes looks at things differently and we need, need the input from each other. And also just mention that there is also help to get in Norway on my heritage. So, and then summary. If you then look at Norway, in my world, at least there are four very important tools. We have my heritage, which I will mention a lot later on. We also have in Norway the National Archives of Norway, the digital archives, which really is pulling together all the archives we have. And uh, for example, all the church books are scanned and available. We can sit on, the, on and look at our screen and read our, uh, our church books. Some of it is also transcribed and been searchable in the, in the database. So that's uh, one of the main tools in Norway. Another one, which is uh, at least when I'm talking to other family historians, is sometimes overlooked, and that is our national library in Norway. In Norway, we are in a process of really scanning and digitizing almost everything, all books, newspaper, and all sorts of documents. And this is becoming available at this uh, national library and um, there was uh, here earlier today a question about what about when I'm not around anymore. And if you produce a book, you can send it to the National Library. They will keep it. They will make it available online when time comes. 
and even web pages, as long as it's a .no web page, that will also be stored by the, the National Library in the future. At least that was their, their claiming at the moment. <laughs> Another aspect which is very important in Norway is all the volunteers that is around. Both on the transcription work, I mean, to making the databases available, information, but also the collaboration. I mean, we need to, to test out uh, uh, thoughts and uh, get the information from each other. So that is very important. Um, I have some views or comments about my heritage, the way I see it. My heritage has made a tool which is so user-friendly that it really has lowered the threshold to start with family history. That result then in that there's a lot more people doing family history than before. It was mentioned here earlier today that it was about 100 million users of my heritage. This is worldwide. It's an incredible number. And not only that, but also it increased the number of family trees available on SuperSearch. A number which has not been mentioned earlier today as far as I could pick up, but uh, according to the MyHeritage uh, company information, there are some 43 million family trees in MyHeritage. That is, an, to me, an even more impressive number, because that signals something like, well, around 40% of the users of MyHeritage have also put a family tree available. It's... Uh, that's, that's really the biggest number for me. And of course, with making all these numbers or information available, yes, it's easier to do family history. So I just would like to thank my heritage for the effort they're putting together and making this tool available. So over to my own research projects. As was mentioned, I've been uh, involved in uh, my own family history for 50 years. It seems to be all that have been speaking here today started when we were teenagers, uh, and that's a good time to start, but very few starts at that time. So. And um, yes, it never ends, but uh, I'm not spending so much time on my own family so, uh, at the moment. The, the really time-consuming uh, part is to try to help others. And it's very much people from around the world which have Norwegian ancestors. And when you're talking about people living outside Norway with Norwegian ancestors, well, they are coming to the States. Because almost half the population in Norway, around 1900, left Norway and went to the States. Uh, as a percentage of, uh, of the population, it's only Ireland that uh, is beating us, I understand. But prior to 1900, I at least been reading some articles that we were highest, the highest, had the highest percentage of all the European countries that went to the States. So we are about 5 million Norwegians here in Norway, uh, probably around 5 million in the States as well, which have some ancestors in Norway. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite a lot of people. When uh, we are doing research for example, in, in the States, for Americans, it's very important to try to find as much information in the States to figure out what was uh, the, the sequence of the life of this, that person before trying to jump to Norway. Because the more accurate data we have in the States or in the, in the new country, the better is the chance to get um, a correct match back to Norway. So that's very important. If you look at the super search collections in my heritage, yes, there are, for Norway, there are a big number for baptism and uh, some on marriages and burials and also a small section of the 1875 census. But 
it, for me at least, it's the family trees, which really is unique for my heritage. When you're searching um, super search for family trees, you also search at uh, the trees that are available on my heritage, and Guy and I, and family search, and a few others. But if you start thinking about this 40% of the users that putting their family trees onto my heritage. In, I think it was about a year ago or so, I saw a number that it was 600,000 my heritage users in Norway. It's probably even more now. It doesn't matter, but if you apply then a percentage of some 40 percent, well, it doesn't matter if it's 40 or 20, but you end up with a large, large number of family trees in Norway. I personally have done a very, very quick check. It's not a scientific check at all, but I think there is a, if you're trying to look for a person who lived in Norway around 1900, there is more than 50% chance that you will find that person in one family tree at my heritage. And to me, that makes my heritage super search a very, very great tool. At least when I'm starting off with a, a new project, trying to find some information to get initial information, it's a well, rather unique tool. I mentioned uh, that uh, we have a close link to, to the States, and of course the numbers in, uh, in, in the States are much, much bigger. And we heard now that uh, also the other uh, indexes of the um, will be available very soon, which will almost have a billion uh, records. So it's a great tool. What I'm very often using are the censuses, and because uh, my heritage has a complete um, package of censuses in the, in the States, of course, the only one that is missing is the 1890 uh, census that uh, was destroyed in a fire in 1921, but that's gone. Basically, there's very, very little left of it, at least. But um, it's a great tool to use. Then I have some sort of rules or guidelines I want to highlight because, well, the more experienced people will say, yes, this is very, very basic, yes, but we sometimes forget to use them even. The one thing that is definitely is urgent is to collect information and photos from the elderly in the family. Or maybe we also should start uh, collecting DNA samples. Uh, but, uh, because one day they are not there anymore. And it just happened. And we realize it when it's too late that we didn't get, had the chat and talk and get the information. It's a big library that disappears as well. Another thing which is very important is, of course, to register the sources of all information we have. We are so, very often so excited, well, we don't have time to register where, where we got the information from. But yes, we have to do that because uh, otherwise, in data without knowing where it comes from is almost useless. It's a, it's a big mi uh, mistake not to do it. And of course, we also have to do some sort of verification or quality checking of all information we have. That's not always very easy, but uh, at least we should uh, make a uh, serious effort to try to, to do that. Now I come to my examples of how I'm using SuperSearch. Since I have been interested in my family history for around 50 years or so, I've also been the person who's been collecting the photos and so on, and I have a family wall. How many of you have a family wall with the, oh yeah, that's good, but all of you should have one, I think. It's really good fun, and it's also something which uh, gets some attention when you get visitors and so on, so it's, it's a good thing, and... Um, of course, you should also remember to put on uh, the names and all the information and where it comes from on all the things. And yes, it's um, sometimes a bit hard work, but it's, it's very important. 
I, um, one of my projects with my own family is to write a book on my grandparents, and also, I'm also doing it for my wife's grandparents, because I want to document this, have it on paper, to send it to the National Archive, so it's not lost. And when I'm doing that, I'm doing a check on each of my grandparents and their ancestors. And one of the checks, of course, is to have a look at super search. Of course, I could also use that on smart matches and so on. I have a, some sort of a preference for being more in control of what I'm doing. That's my, my background. So I, I like super search in this. So one of my great, great, great grandmother, she was Anne Birgitte Nilsdatter. She was born in 1805 at Örskog in the west coast of Norway, uh, south of Trondheim. So I just typed in that and in an in a ordinary way to, to use uh, super search. And this was the result. And uh, there was a lot of matches on uh, Anne Birgitte. What really caught my attention was the number two from the top. I've never seen a photo of her before in my life. This was the first time. And um, of course, I s the, the rest of the information here looks uh, okay. Yes, it's uh, definitely her. And I start thinking, of, well, I have a new photo on my family wall. It's been some 15 or 20 years since last I've been of any of my ancestors to put up. There is no only grandchildren that have been put on my family wall. So I'm really getting excited on these things. I'm, I'm running to the printer and want to put it up. Yes, we are so easy, easy to go on and put it on the wall. It's such a great thing, but then it's good to have some sort of rules or guidelines. So I say, well, hold on back, Vida. There was five or six others that had the same photo on the, in their family tree. So it must be, must be something good here, huh? I apply my rules, and at the moment, I'm still checking. I've been in contact with some of the people who have put them on the family trees. Some of them have said, well, it's a smart match, smart match. and uh, they are happy with that. And that's it's fine for me that they are happy with it. But I want a better evidence. I want to, to verify it. I need a, some sort of a reliable uh, source that I can stand up and say, yes, I think this is a, a correct uh, version. I'm not there yet, I'm working on it, and uh, it will be interesting to see what the outcome is. So, um, but this takes a little bit of time, but uh, that's, I can, can wait a year even if, it, if that's necessary, <laughs> because I spend so much time anyway. Another example is a man called Erik Dobre. I spent many hours looking for information on him the last well, couple of months. He, I was in, kept in contact with some of his ancestors, sorry, descendants in uh, the States, and uh, got the information that he was born um, in about 1841 in Norway. His wife was Caroline Schurz. Schurz doesn't sound Norwegian, in, at least not typical Norwegian, it's more German. She was born around 1856. We didn't know if she was born in the States or in Norway or Germany or wherever. They had some children, at least Florence and Adolf, and they lived in Minnesota. That's a good start, at least, to try to find. And as I mentioned, I definitely want to find as much information in the States before jumping over to Norway. Is this readable at all? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good <laughs> because it's sometimes a bit difficult to know if it's uh, good enough or not. 
I um, typed in Eric Dovre, born 1841 in Norway. And now comes the, the, this is the top result, Eric Dovre, born 1845. Well, it's not 1841, but four years out. That's uh, seen a much bigger uh, inaccuracy than that, so that uh, didn't worry me too much. And he was living in Minnesota, in Winona City, or at least in Winona. So that was a, a good match, uh, thinking of. And uh, when you click on to get more information on this one, it's this page that comes up. And what, if you look at the lower left corner here, beautiful image. And that's really a great, great tool on my heritage. Because when you click on that, you get to see the original. And you should always have a look at the original. Because very often, there is even additional information there. By just looking at what's transcribed and into the database, that could be, sometimes could be a short version of all the, all the information. So really look at uh, the um, <coughs> original. And here, yes, we find Eric Dovre. Most likely his wife, Caroline, and um, the children, and it looks fine. So that's, um, that's a good start. We found him. Very easy. But why didn't we, I find him in the other censuses? Because it should be likely to find him in the 1890s, sorry, <laughs> 95 or 80. No, I'm... <laughs> What's the question? The sequence that it took to get there. Oh, the sequence. Yeah, I typed in this and super. Uh, there are some problems with the questions uh, because uh, the streaming doesn't get it. But the the question is the sequence. I typed in the information at Super Search. I got got the res, got the result here. I'm clicking on Eric Dovre. I get this page, and at the lower end corner here is the view full image. I clicked on that one, and then I get to the original document. But I was trying to find him also in the other censuses, which is available. And I didn't that initially. And I had to struggle a little bit, at least I had. I'm sure by the end of the day, when we get all the experts on doing super search, telling us how to do this, I have learned a lot so I can do it much more efficient. But that's the way it is. My next uh, example is that I find it very important to home in on the, the area, the residence, where, where actually where the person was living. And also to check the original document, as I mentioned. I had found Eric Dovre in the 1895 um, uh, census. And he lived in... Um, in uh, Rochester in 1885, I also found that. But if I just added Rochester onto the search, I was not getting anything for the 1880. So what I really wanted to do is to look specifically at Rochester. So I went to the US uh, censuses, where you have a very nice collection of them and clicked on the 1880 census, typed in just Eric, just very, very few information, because I want, didn't want to be too restricted by the other. I also typed in that he was, um, and it was on, uh, only that I wanted similar um, names and not exactly, so I'm quite flexible on that. 
I also put in the year of birth of Norway, but what I was really strict on was uh, and wanted a match required was the, the residence or the location, Rochester, Olmsted in Minnesota. So, were there any Eric in Rochester? That was really what I was trying to look for. Yes, there was quite a few Eric, and there was one called Eric D. He was, in fact, born in Norway about 1841. Sounds to be a good candidate. So I clicked on this again, and as I mentioned before, the census is in, in the States and on my heritage. You have access to the original. And then you click on to the original, you get up a page like this, and you, I'm blowing up the, just the, the typed in information. And if you really get to the, to the original, what has been transcribed as Eric D. When I read it, it's Eric Dovre. That sounds familiar. And he was a warder and uh, was working on the, um, on the railway system in the, in the States. Clerk on, in dry goods, I think, says here. So, what was a bit hard to find on the, on the, in the database I searched, but when you really look into the more in the details, you get it. The next uh, example is um, again a bit on looking at the original. This time I was trying to find him in the 1900 census. I was again quite flexible in one way on his uh, first name. I just typed in E for Eric. And in the, one of the options you have in my heritage, you can also choose that it's the name starting with a let, the one or two letters or three letters. So I just typed in E. And D-O-V for Dovre. Again, as uh, the starting letters. <coughs> but I uh, was not uh, very much flexible on the, the location. I wanted to see if he was still in Nona in Minnesota. So that's the information I put in, in the, the database and clicked search and this was the result. Eric Dovre. Well, it doesn't look like Eric, well, Edith Dover. It's uh, not exactly the same, but when I look at uh, the more of the details, uh, um, to me, Edith is a female name, at least in Norway. I'm not sure how it is in, in the States, but um, I... Born January 1841 in Norway. That sounds uh, interesting. And uh, the wife was Carrie. Dover, Carrie and Caroline, that's, uh, I mean, that have been uh, mixed up uh, all the time, so that's, uh, there's no problem with that. And the children, Florence and Robert and Adolf, at least Florence and Adolf was, uh, well, they've seen Robert as well around, so. So this looked a bit somewhat strange, but there was a lot of indications that this could be correct. So when you're clicking on the, uh, the link from Edit Dover, it still says Edit Dover, and I'm blowing up the, the original. Yes, I can very well understand that the person who transcribed this wrote Edit Dover. But if I'm looking a little bit more carefully on Edit, I'm not the person who made registered this, I think probably he had written Eric, and but someone has been uh, 
cluttering a little bit with it <laughs> somewhat later on. Again, it's definitely the, the right family. And by reading the original, we see that they have been married for eight years. See the column with eight there. Well, that's a bit strange because they had a child which was uh, 17. So there are this information, this original gives you a lot of additional information on this one. So when you look at censuses, get the whole thing. And I'm not, she also tells that she had five children and three of them was living. And the year of, of uh, immigration is uh, on, over here and how long they have stayed in the States and so on. <clears throat> the, my last example here today is uh, trying to find Erik Dovre in Norway. From uh, researching more records in the States, I found his death certificate, which stated that he was born 6th of January, 1841, in Upland in Norway. And of course, that is, uh, if it's correct, it's a very, very useful information, because uh, there was not that many Eric born 6th of January, 1841, in Norway. And was spelled as Eric with a C in, in the States. In Norway, we spell it with a K. That's, uh, it's uh, very rare that we try to spell it in a very uh, different way. And Dovre is uh, an, uh, a, a small area in uh, Lesha Parish, and also a mountain, big mountain area in Norway. So it could be <laughs> some sort of where he got the Dovre name from could be a bit, uh, a little bit uncertain. But in uh, around uh, 1860, 1870, when he left Norway, or he didn't have family name, he had the patronym. So if his father was had the first name of Ole, then his uh, last uh, Eric's last name would be Ole with adding a sen or a, as a son, so then his name would be Erik Olsen. But I didn't know that, of course, at the time. So I went to Super Search again. This time, I wanted to go to the baptism records that is available on uh, Super Search for Norway. It states here in a uh, very small text here that's only a few localities are included and the time period varies by locality. Yes, but still uh, the number of records seems to be 22 million, which is an enormous big number for being people born in Norway during that period. So it must be all sort of parents and all sort to of create it into that uh, number of, of um, in order to create a, a record out of it. I typed in Eric and sorry, and I wanted that to be exactly because there is not much uh, chance that it could be spelled differently. And I also put in the birth date, 6th of January 1841, and Upland County in Norway. That was all I put in, and out come the results of basically all Eriks in Upland County. And if you look at the second match here, it says Erik Olsen, and in fact he was born 6th of January 1841, and he was born uh, and he was uh, christened 24th of January 1841 in Lesha Parish in Upland County. And his parents was Ole Eriksen and Marit Knutsatter. So this is a pretty good match. I mean, it's uh, 
relatively solid match. I, I can stand up for this one and defend it. So, to have a good date of birth from the state helps you a lot. When I go into the more uh, of the more details from uh, the, that uh, match, I get up a page like this. But again, I want to check the original. And in this case, in Norway, unfortunately, we cannot get the original on my heritage. But we have the originals on, in the digital archive, which is completely free of use and can be used all over the world. So, in this case, I had to go to the digital archives. Normally, when we, most of us probably use digital archives, we go to the uh, database uh, search uh, area. But that was not what we wanted. We wanted to, I wanted to read the original church book. And uh, it's not that streamlined to get that to, to the, these pages on the, the digital archives. Because first, or at least one way, one route is to go to the menu that you have on the top. Then you get the page which is quite busy, which looks like this one. Again, yes, you have to find the right one, and the right one is scanned archives. And you get to another rather busy page. <laughs> I, I'm wondering why I made it so, <laughs> so difficult for us. <laughs> because this is something we should use almost, well, we use daily in people who are spending time on family history. And on this one, we go to the lower left corner, parish registry. And at, even at the bottom there, it says Brown, Rose in parish registry, Norway. Now we start to get closer. Then we get the search page <laughs> for all this. And I wanted to go to Lesha. And um, you can type in on the, the parish level here. You can also type in the, the county if you are uncertain of, uh, of the parish and so on. But I've been so used to this. I go normally direct to the parish I want to, to look for. And I type in Lesha. And then I get up what's on the right side of this page. All the, well, this is the top part of it, of the, the church books in, in Lesha. And if you look at this book here, yes, it's a Dovre local parish for the period 1820 to 42. That's the right period. Now we're really getting close. Um, to, to the right, there is some abbreviations for the baptism, confirmation, and marriage, and burials, and so on. And a lot of people use that. I don't think that's a good practice to, to use that. You should go to the content list because then you go direct you have the opportunity to go direct to the year. Otherwise, you go to the start from the baptism and you have to look for the right year. So, so I think this is a, a much better way to, to finally get there. <laughs> because when you then click on 8041 for the Dobre, you get <laughs> this page. And on top here, is Eric. If I blow this one up a little bit, it's maybe a little bit easier to, to see. Yes, it's a child named Eric. He was born 6th of January. He was baptized 24th of January in the Dovre church. And his parents was Husman, we call it in Norway, or Tenant farmer is probably a better, uh, or some sort of a translation of it. Ole Eriksen, Kloppen. So he was living at the Kloppen, Husmansplatz, the tenant's farm, which was a part of the bigger farm at Dovre called Tofte. 
So that's why Toft is written under his name uh, up there. And his wife, Marit Knustater. <clears throat> and also here, you see to the right, you have all the people who witnessed uh, the baptism and the godfathers and so on. So that's additional information. When uh, in Norway, we also have Bygdeböcker, some sort of farm and family history books for almost all municipalities in Norway. It's a great collection of books, which is also, most of them is available at the National Library. So you can search to find the book. You can also search to find names in the book. So instead of trying to flip through a book, you really search it. It's an excellent tool. So when I was looking for the, the Kloppen uh, um, farm in the big the book, I could find much more information. And yes, correct, Ole Eriksson, he left uh, the farm and went to the States. So it's, we should also match up with the information. Another aspect which is quite important is to have a source citation. You want to know where I find this information. Yes, you can, of course, uh, download the, the picture from the book, but uh, you can also um, get uh, it uh, in, in writing. And if you click on this symbol here, which I mark in a red square, then <coughs> the, you get a source citation onto your clipboard, which you can copy into your program or wherever you want to use it. And it looks like this, or you have some options or you can choose from. This is a version that I normally like. So, after quite a few hours of work, or not only hours, days, months almost, <laughs> things take time, I found Eric Olsen born at Dovre in 1841. He changed his name to, to Dovre, Eric Dovre, when he came to the States and lived there and died there in 1920. This is a picture of the Dovre church, which I took uh, this summer. You see there's no clouds on the sky. There was an excellent summer this year. And it's quite a... A church, you can probably see that the walls are covered with stone, with slates from local slate. So it's both the roof and the walls are covered. It's uh, quite, quite impressive to see, at least I, I find it very impressive. So that was uh, the part of Eric Dovre. As I mentioned, uh, we need to get some input and help from time to time. And in Norway, we have various, various forums where you can get such assistance. Of course, Facebook is becoming more and more popular in Norway from among uh, family historians. And the one which is, uh, most, has most activity on Facebook is a forum called We Som Driver Stegsfors, well, we that is doing family history. That's so, uh, but there are also other forums and the digital archives have their own forum, the user forum, which is also a very good uh, forum and been a lot of good quality uh, responses you find there. And the third one is uh, Schlecht's forum, which is a genealogy society of Norway is running. So all these three forums is about equal uh, activity level on. So it's a bit, yeah, your own taste which one to, to choose. And, uh, but if you want to use all of them, please make it very clear that you have posted it somewhere else before. So you don't get people angry at you because, well, you have already got, got this answer. <laughs> and I also want to highlight one thing, and that is help reading the original. It's not for everyone to find it easy to read text from 
written in 1800 or even earlier days. Most of us need some help, at least some sort of quality check, even if you are tra trained. There is a dedicated forum for that, which I would like to highlight, and that you find that at this Flex forum. And, well, this is probably not possible for you to read, but if you blow it up, it says help to tuning of children material. So it's help for reading the original text. There are some really good experts there helping out. There are some retired people, good. <laughs> working, have been working at the archives, so they are really the good experts. Uh, and they are still there and, and, and helping out and giving an excellent job. So as long as they are around and helping out, it's, uh, if they are not able to read it, well, you have made the, the best at it. You can uh, go to this uh, sub forum and uh, post an uh, inquiry and you will get help. I think everyone gets help there. It's an excellent tool. Since we are at my heritage conference, I also want to highlight some help you get in Norway on, uh, among the users. This is the, the user forum at the, sorry, the my heritage Norwegian Bruke Gruppe is not run by MyHeritage, it's no direct link to it, but they are run by users, and in particular is one person called, named Hilde Tinlen. I'm not sure if she is in this room at the moment, but she at least doing a fantastic job. She is giving to the point uh, responses and, uh, yeah, it, it, she's, I really admire the work she is doing. She's an excellent uh, manager of that group. Of course, my heritage also have their own uh, blog in Norway and, uh, and the Facebook group, which is uh, very big, 27,000 uh, members, which is big for being uh, anything in Norway on, uh, on, uh, on Facebook. So, and... Uh, Yael is uh, handling that uh, excellently, so, and also the blog, so we are we're really lucky here in Norway. The, to summarize a, a bit, I find a lot of help by trying to focus my search, also to find exactly what source do I want to look at? For example, which uh, census do I want to look at? Not just a general search, but pick the census I want to look and also the area. That uh, helps a lot. And I'm a fan of my own uh, family history rules. Uh, that helps me from time to time, and uh, I think it will help most people to, to take a break and, and uh, consider, oh, have I done the right thing now? And get help reading the original, if needed. Because there is a lot of information there. So that brings me to the end. And I would like to thank you.